friends and welcome to my channel this doctor brain for medicine journey in this lecture we will we will review the most common topics in general medicine with some of the electrolyte disturbances mainly hypokalemia by the end of this lecture you will be able to define hypokalemia to know the causes the symptoms how to evaluate patient with hypokalemia and what's the treatment. Now, normal potassium level, it's between 3.5 to 5. We consider it mild hypokalemia if it's between 3 to 3.4, moderate if it's between 2.5 to 2.9, severe if it's between 2 to 2.5, and critical if it's less than 2. Now, what are the causes of hypokalemia? So, it can be simply pseudo-hypokalemia, so superiors, like sampling error. Check with the nurse if she took the sample immediately after recent line flush, or if it, she took it from uh, the same arm where there was ongoing IV fluid. Hypokalemia can be because of low intake which is seen in subpopulation like elderly patients, patients with eating disorders and chronic alcohol abuser. Also it can be as a cause of external loss, check the GI symptoms. So GI system, if the patient has vomiting, diarrhea, bilis adenoma or using laxative. Also, hypokalemia can be a result of renal loss, which is, can be primary, the problem in the kidneys themselves, like renal tuberal acidosis, type 1 and type 2. And there are some genetic disorders like Barter, Lidl, and Gentleman. Or it can be secondary to something else that affect the kidney and increase the exertion of potassium through the kidneys. And these mainly medications like diuretics and the most common ones, thiazide, lob diuretics, and osmotics. Some antibiotics also can cause hypokalemia through renal loss, like penicillin, clindamycin, amphetricin P, some steroids, and theophylline. Some diseases like primary aldosteronism and some electrolyte disturbances like low magnesium, which can cause refractory hypokalemia. Another cause of hypokalemia, which usually modest and mild hypokalemia, like it's transcellular potassium shifts. So some medication, they play on the potassium and increase the shifting uh, from extracellular to intracellular like insulin and beta agonists. If the patient has alkalosis as well, there will be shifting of potassium from extracellular to intracellular, in thyrotoxicosis, and in familial periodic paralysis. Now, what are the symptoms of hypokalemia? Usually, if it's mild, patient will be asymptomatic, but if it's moderate to severe, or there is rapid decrease in the potassium level, so the patient will be symptomatic. Mainly, the symptoms include muscular system, so the patient will complain of cramps, spasm, weakness, and it's mainly lower limbs more than upper limbs, and proximal muscles more than distal muscles. In severe cases, the patient will have paralysis, and if it's involved in the system, this will end up with respiratory failures and if it's involved the GI system this will end up with ileus which can cause constipation and nausea and vomiting as a consequence. In severe case as well of hypokalemia the patient might have rhabdomyosis. Now what are the cardiovascular manifestations? So patients with hypokalemia they can have sinus bradycardia AV block, 
any kind of cardiac arrhythmias. So suspect any kind of cardiac arrhythmias in patients with hyperkalemia. They might have premature atria, supraventricular or ventricular complexes, third ST point, and the most risky one, which is ventricular fibrillation. Now, how to evaluate patients with hypokalemia? So history-wise, ask the patient if he has any symptoms like vomiting, diarrhea. If your patient is on NGT, check if there is like regular suctioning, regular tube drainage. In the background of the patient, ask if they are following specific low calorie diets, especially keto diet, which is very common nowadays. Check if your patient is a chronic alcohol abuser or if your patient is in renal disease and on dialysis. This patient, they have fluctuations of the potassium level, sometimes high, sometimes low. Family history important for familial periodic paralysis and medication is very important. Check if your patient is on diuretics or some antibiotics, as we said, or laxative. Now, a physical examination, check the blood pressure, and if it's high, persistently high, with hypokalemia, think about primary uh, aldosteronism, hyperaldosteronism. If your patient has GI loss, has gastroenteritis, check the volume status. So, dehydration signs usually include dry mucous membrane, decreased skin triggers. If your patient is a chronic alcohol abuser, check for withdrawal signs like agitation, sweating, tachycardia, and hand tremors. As a consequence of hyperkalemia, the patient might come with ileus. So check for abdominal distension, tenderness, minimal or absent bowel sounds. Also, hypokalemia can cause decreased deep tender reflexes. So check the reflexes. Now, what's the investigation we need? First, we need to confirm the low level, so repeat the test, then do ECG to check if there is any change, assess renal function test, and order for other electrolytes, especially magnesium. In some cases, we need blood gas like in alkalosis patients. Now what are the ECG change in patients with hypokalemia? They will have prolonged PR, ST depression, flattened T wave, U wave, which is a wave that following T wave, and they might have Q2 prolongation. If it's still after the history and after physical examination, still the cause is not that clear. Here we have to order for urinary potassium. So check the urinary potassium. The best way is the 24 hour urine collection, but it's actually less practical, difficult to be done. If done, uh, the 24 hour collection potassium is more than 15, so this may renal loss. If it's less than 15, this means extra renal loss. There is another test which is easier, more practical, which is urine spot. And uh, they check for urine potassium to creatinine ratio. So it's actually less reliable, but it's faster. And again, if the levels more than 15 to 20, so the renal loss, or more than less than 15 to 20, this is external loss. Now, how to treat hypokalemia? So first of all, if your patient has mild hypokalemia and they come with like gastroenteritis, so simple hydration will be enough. So hydrate the patient if there is signs of dehydration. Replace the magnesium in hypomagnesemia patient before giving any potassium. And if there is a suspecting medication, so hold the offending medication and see. Diuretics, diuretics can be replaced by potassium sparing diuretics. Now, how to replace potassium? 
Usually, in mild to moderate cases, and the patient is symptomatic, and he can tolerate oral therapy, we can start with potassium chloride tablet or syrup. We can give up to 40 to 80 mg equivalent per day, and know that each 10 mg equivalent will increase the potassium, serum potassium level by 0.1. Okay. Now the tablet or syrup best taken with or soon after food to reduce the gastrointestinal irritation. Now, if your patient has severe hypokalemia or symptomatic or they have ECG change or cannot tolerate oral therapy, then we have to do parenteral replacement. Always dilute potassium chloride. Do not give potassium as a polis or IV brush. It should be diluted by normal saline or dextrose. We prefer normal saline more than dextrose as dextrose will stimulate will stimulate the release of insulin and this will will drive the extracellular potassium into the cells. It's not that uh, th this effect is not that clear and obvious so we still can use dextrose but if there's no contraindication to use normal saline we prefer normal saline okay and we have two lines whether are through peripheral line or central line now through peripheral line the maximum infusion we can every one hour or per hour it's 10 milli equivalent and the concentration of potassium shouldn't exceed 40 to 60 millimol per liter as higher strength can cause phlebitis and pain. So through the IV, the peripheral line, you can give up to 10 mg per hour and do not exceed 40 to 60 millimol per liter. Okay? Usually the order will be potassium chloride 40 millimol with sodium chloride 500 to 1000 ml and infuse over at least four hours. Now, if we use central line, we can infuse more than 10 mL equivalent per hour and actually up to 40 mL equivalent per hour. And also we can give maximum 80 mL equivalent per liter. But here, when we use central line, we need continuous ECG monitoring. So this is all for today. Hope you enjoyed the lecture if you feel like uh, you get the information you want and you like the video please subscribe to our channel thank you and see you soon with another video bye